But now I'm going to talk about wills, uh, and um, we'll talk some, about some issues relating to wills and what happens without a will, what are some issues to think about wills. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about uh, one of the stories from my book, from this book. This book is called Where There's an Inheritance. This is, these are stories that Barry and I have lived through for the last, I've been since 1989, Barry since 1973. Um, and I'm going to tell some stories. We also have two other books that we've written. Uh, one is called The Family Fight, Planning to Avoid It. This is what you need to know from our perspective when you're preparing your will. What you need to think about with the all the stuff I'm going to talk about now. And then we have another book that it's called The Family War, Winning the Inheritance Battle. And we wrote this with a very skilled estate specialist, Jordan Ayton. And if you're in a battle in a will, if you're thinking of fighting a will, if you want to sue the executor, uh, what are the grounds to attack a will? Because you need grounds to attack a will. It's not just good enough to say it's not fair. You need grounds. Um, we talk about that in that book. But anyways, back to the, the book Where There's an Inheritance, which is this one. Um, this, this woman, we see a lot of greed uh, and a lot of shocking stories. And this woman calls me up um, on a, uh, after a radio show and said to me, Les, I've got to tell you a story of greed that will just shock you. So I said, what is it? She said, well, I have no kids of my own. I only have nieces and nephews. Uh, and they were my babies. They were my wonderful babies. They would come over, we'd sit and talk, and we, we loved each other. And I wasn't feeling well, and I went to the doctor, and he told me that I have 95% blockage, and I need open-heart surgery. So I, I spoke to my eldest niece, Janine, and I said, look, Janine, the keys to my house are going to be in the bed. Beside the bed, there's a little drawer. They'll be there. If something happens to me, just go into the house and do what you have to do. She said, Les, guess what? I had the operation. Uh, it was bad, uh, but I'm fine. And they sent me home much earlier than anybody expected. And they gave me a bunch of pills to take, and I went home. And I'm taking my pill, and all of a sudden, at my dining room table, one of the pills falls down and drops down, and it rolls under the dining room table. And I bend down to pick it up, and I notice under my dining room table, there's a sticky. And I get closer to it, and my niece's name is on that sticky. And I said, why is my niece's name on a sticky under my dining room table? Then I just out of curiosity, I went to my TV, and I noticed on the side of my TV was my nephew's name. And then I went to my china cabinet, my other niece's name, and my whole house had these yellow stickies. They had come into my house and labeled everything I owned like it was Christmas morning. They were taking this stuff. And she said, I only pray for one thing, that I can look down from the heavens and see the faces of my nieces and nephews when they realize I left everything to a charity in my new will. So this is the kind of greed that you see. Now, so let's talk about what happens if you don't have a will. What happens if you don't have a will? Well, if you don't have a will, the government of Ontario writes the will for you. And how many people are happy about that? No, not too many. So, so without a will, your wife gets the first 200,000, your husband gets the first 200, uh, and then you're, if you have two kids, they get two-thirds of the rest, and your spouse gets one-third. Most people want their spouse to get everything. But if without a will, that's not going to happen unless there's no kids. Now, when you do have uh, money going to the kids when there's no will, guess what? It goes to the kids at 18. Uh, and there's a story in our book of that exact thing happening. Mother and father died. Uh, the estate went to two young children, uh, 18 and 19, I believe, or 20. Uh, and the, the, the daughter contacted us and said, how do we get rid of my brother? He spent every nickel that he inherited on drugs, on alcohol, and now he's coming after me and saying, it's mom's money, share the, yours with me. So we don't want to leave 18-year-olds a lot of money. So in a will, we can set up a trust where your money is managed and invested for those children or grandchildren until they're at mature age, like 25, 30, whatever. Uh, without a will, it's a mess. There's no executor named. You need an executor, but without a will, no will, no executor. So somebody has to apply to become the estate administrator, basically. So it can be very, very messy. The other thing is, uh, how many people in this room would love to see their daughter-in-law, after they die, after you die, your daughter-in-law running on the beach in the Bahamas saying, guess what, I left my husband and I took half the money made from the money that he inherited from his father. I'm going to see a show of hands. Nobody, okay. So without a will, your, your son and your son, daughter-in-law, they, they basically can fight for half the money made from the inheritance because with a will, we put a special clause in the will called the family law clause. And so many of the wills that I review do not have that clause in it. And that clause is one of the most important clauses you can ever put into your will 
because it basically plugs the hole so that your son, if he inherits your money and he invests it, your daughter-in-law cannot, or whatever, cannot fight for half the money made from that inheritance. In Ontario, it's binding, it stops it. Without it, that's what you get. So it's very important to do the will and plan properly. Now, what about homemade wills? Well, I'll tell you a homemade will story. This woman comes into my office, because I mentioned we do free will reviews, and we're happy to look at them for free, and we'll sit down with you and go through the clauses, and if we find things, we'll tell you. If we don't, we'll tell you as well. But this woman comes into me, and she said, she had an accent, I don't want to mock her accent, but she said, basically, um, my uh, neighbor told me that uh, I should bring this will in. I'm sure it's perfect. I don't know why I'm here, but she said to come in, but it's perfect. I know it's perfect. So don't waste your time and my time. Just look quickly and go through. So I looked at it, and it's about 26 pages, and it was all like scribbled and typed and don't ask. And finally, I get to one section where it finally says who the beneficiary and who the executor of the will is. So I said to her, I said, I guess you only have one child named Frank. She said, what are you talking about? You're trying to sell me a will? I have three children. They're in the will. I said, no, it says here that I leave everything to my son, Frank, because he's the best son in the world. Nobody's like him. He's done everything for me. He's a gift from God. He's the greatest thing since sliced bread, whatever she said. And I want him to inherit everything, and I want him to be my executor. So, I, so she looks at it. She says, oh, my God, she said, I don't believe what I'm seeing here. No, she said, I, I'm shocked. I said, ma'am. Who wrote your will for you? She said, Frank did. <laughs> okay. So a true story, okay? It's in, it's in our book, okay? So you, when you read about just homemade wills, a lot of them are a recipe for wars. And we see things in these homemade wills that would shock, you know, we see gifting of the same assets. We see gifting of assets that don't exist anymore. People who, are, who, who, who they hate are still their executors and they never reviewed them. Uh, people who have passed away, 97-year-old Uncle Fred is still the executor, uh, the only executor of this will. Uh, uh, my, my house on John Street to my son, but she now lives on Major Street, and Major Street doesn't ex didn't exist when she made her will. She thought that if I leave my, my name my house, he'll get it, but he's, you don't live there anymore. You don't own it, so the kid would get nothing. He wouldn't get the house. It would go to the estate, uh, and the estate would split it up. So you've got to be very, very careful. I leave my 2010 X whatever car to my son Bill, but if you if you have a new car in 2016, it's not going to get he's not going to get that car. So it's very very important that you make sure that you update your will, review your will. And these homemade wills, you've got to be careful. A lot of people bring in homemade wills that aren't even made in Ontario. Uh, I see wills. I saw a will from France. I saw a will from Germany. I saw uh, these people in Ontario doing these wills that I, I said this isn't even proper Ontario law that you're talking about. Why are you doing this? So a lot of people are penny wise, pound foolish, and they'll do these homemade wills thinking, wow, it's great, it works. Well, it only works when you die, and when you die, you're not going to know how great it is or how bad it is. So you better do this right the first time and keep it up to date as your situations change. Now, let's talk now about thinking about a will and what you need to know in wills. So the very first thing you need to do is appoint an executor. We're on this side of the Grand Canyon now, okay? So you appoint an executor. Who can that executor be? Well, first of all, if your son lives in France or lives in Australia, the one who lives in Australia can be an, can be an executor easily, but the one who lives in France, no. If they don't live in the British Commonwealth, they'll have to post a bond before they can be your executor. So if your son lives in Buffalo, it could be a problem. Son lives in Australia, he can be the executor before your son in Australia, when he has to, doesn't have to post a bond. Now, who can be executors? People don't realize this, that yes, your children who are beneficiaries can be executors. Your wife can be an executor. You don't have to appoint a stranger or a cousin to be the executor if you're leaving everything to your wife and your kids. As a matter of fact, most times, if the wife is the beneficiary, the wife's the executor. The son's a beneficiary, son can be executor. It's really up to you. Now, what about how many should I appoint? Well, if you have three kids, as I said, you could have all three with majority rule. Why Barry and I like to have involvement of all the people because we had a situation where we had three brothers come into our office as friends and leaving as enemies. Why? Mom died. She appointed the eldest son. It's, that doesn't always mean it's the right person if it's the eldest child. Just because somebody is the eldest doesn't mean they're the right one. Uh, and she appointed the eldest son to be the executor. They all sat in our office, the three boys, and the, that executor's son became a dictator. And he said, I want this meeting 
to only go forward when they leave the room. I'm the executor, I'm the boss, I'll decide what happens to this estate and they'll get their money, no problem, one third, one third, one third, but I'm gonna decide what happens. Well, after the next day, we got a call from the two brothers basically begging us, don't let my brother sell the family cottage. He hates it, we love it, and we know he's gonna sell it and just give us the money. We, you can't buy that again, it, it's got family history in it, but, we don't, but he doesn't care about it. So there she, they created a di dictatorship. If you appointed all three kids, they would have sat in the room together, voted, and that would have been the situation. Okay? Now, uh, make sure you update your executors as well, because you know, is it the right person? Are you still friends with this person? Do you want this person to be your executor? This person, does the person want to be your executor? Yeah, ask that person, do they want to be your executor? Because many people don't want to be executors. Okay? Um, now, if you have young children, you need to appoint a guardian. A guardian to raise your children. What if you and your spouse are killed? What's, who's gonna, I don't know how any young parents can go to sleep at night not making a will. I, I, I don't get it. You know, if you, if you know what, what Barry and I see, then you would run out and make a will for young parents because these kids, I mean, you could literally, if you don't have guardians named in your will, you could have that side fighting against this side for the custody of your child. Your in-laws against the other in-laws fighting. People who once loved each other are now fighting over this child. So in a will, you can specify. Two things we recommend. One is if you, if you are appointing a guardian, I would recommend a different guardian than your executor, two different people, so, that one, so you have check and balance. So that if you're, see if your executor is the same person as a guardian, he has access to all the money, and he can buy a house in Forest Hill with your money, move in with those kids, and guess what? The money's pretty well gone. But if you have an executor and a guardian separate, and the guardian says, I wanna move to Forest Hill, the executor say, no, no, you can move to Richmond Hill. It's cheaper, okay? So that's what an executor and guardian difference can do. The other thing I'll tell you is, I recommend if you're appointing a guardian, the first thing people say is, I'll appoint my brother and his wife or my sister and her husband. Well, not always a great idea. Uh, there's a story in the book about uh, a husband and wife that got killed. They appointed their, he, she appointed her sister and her husband as the guardians. And they basically took over the children. They raised these kids until she found her husband cheating on her. She threw him out of the house and he used the kids as extortion in the in divorce settlement because guess what? He had equal custody of those children because he was named in the will as a guardian. So my recommendation is only name the blood relative, the sister or the brother. That way, if they ever get divorced, there's not gonna be a custody battle over your children, okay? So that's guardianship. Now, there's a few things that people have to realize. One is, Marriage revokes your will, okay? So marriage revokes your will. So if you made a will five years ago and you got married today, you no longer have a will. And people don't realize that. So if you go into a second marriage and you don't make a new will after that second marriage, guess what? You have no will. The will's invalid. Marriage in Ontario revokes a will. So, I mean, somebody told me there's three rings to a marriage. One is the engagement ring, one is the wedding ring, and the third ring is suffering. So <laughs> make sure you make a will and you get remarried, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, in terms of um, guardian, in terms of the exact, we have the custody. Now let's talk about the marriage revokes the will, now we're gonna talk about separation. Separation does not revoke your will. So number one, if you die without a will and you're separated and you have no kids, guess who gets your estate under the law? Your separated spouse gets everything because you're still married. So if you're separated, you better make a will. And you better change your designations on your life insurance and all of your RSPs and things like that. If you're separated, make a will uh, and uh, definitely see a lawyer to the separation agreement and the whole thing. Uh, but make a will so that you can leave it to your kids uh, in case some, you know, if you pass away. Otherwise, if without a will, that, spouse, that quote, separated spouse will get everything. Common law. Many people are living common law today not realizing that if they, if they die without a will, that common law partner is not entitled to an automatic inheritance. So common law is not recognized as an automatic inheritance. That common law partner would have to go to court to make claims possibly on being a dependent, getting support, all these other issues. But if you're common law, you make a will, your common law partner can get your assets. Divorce only re doesn't revoke your whole will, it just revokes reference to your former spouse. So these are all issues, if you're in any of those situations, it's very important to look at your life situation and say, I got married, should I make a new will, blah, blah, blah. Now, we're also seeing a lot of older people get 
remarried. Uh, and um, you often see people coming in saying, uh, or hearing, say, Les, you know, I want to make a will. I'm getting, I, I just, they come in alone, usually this, one of the spouses, and comes in and says, I want to leave everything to my kids for my first marriage. I love my kids for my first marriage. I really love my second wife. But my kids for my first marriage are everything to me, and I want to protect them. So the first question I'll ask is, okay, do you have a house? Yes, we do. How do you hold it? Oh, it's joint with my second wife. Okay, how about RSPs? Oh, she's named on there. I said, how about life insurance? Oh, she's named on there. How about your bank accounts? Oh, she's joint with me. So I said, okay, those are all your assets? He said, yeah. What do you want to leave your wife? What, what is it that you want to leave your children? He said, oh, everything. Guess what? If he dies, the kids get nothing. All of that stuff overrides the will. The house being joint means the wife gets it. The RSPs naming her means the wife gets it. The insurance naming the wife means the wife gets it. The bank accounts being joint means the wife gets it. So if you're in a second marriage, be very careful. You've got to do your planning correct. And also be careful of this quote. Don't worry, honey. I will look after your kids after you die. Okay? I hear that over and over. Okay? Because what ends up happening is quite often, you know, a person will die and that other person will call me and say, Les, I've got to make a new will. I, I just met Mary and I love her. And, uh, you know, so you've got to be careful. Uh, don't believe, well, some of you can, but be careful, beware when, when your second spouse says, leave it to me and I'll leave it all to your kids after you die. Be very careful. Okay? Now, um, let's talk about protecting Oh, well, let's talk about the, the sort of the, the older people getting married. So we're seeing a lot of older people getting married to second marriages. And what ends up happening is you've got to be very careful because you get married, you don't make a new will, you die without a will. If you're, if, let's say you're a 90-year-old man, you get remarried to a, to a 40-year-old. Um, and I've seen that happen. Uh, and you die and you don't make a will because you don't know your will is revoked upon marriage. She's your spouse. She gets the first 200000 automatically of your estate. So you've got to be careful. And it reminds me of this other, this other joke where this, these two older men, one is, uh, one is 80 and one's 75, uh, and they say to, one says, you know, Charlie, I just met this most beautiful woman. She's 40 years old. Uh, and his friend said, why would a 40-year-old want to date some 75-year-old man like you? He says, because I lied about my age. He says, what did you tell her you're 65? No, no, I told her I'm 95. That way she gets the inheritance. <laughs> okay, so. Um, and then there's this joke about this man who walks in to a bar. And he says, he sees this beautiful girl in the bar. And he says to her, he says, you know, uh, what's your name? So my name is Sharon. He says, uh, your name is Sharon. Uh, Sharon, my dad owns castles. My dad owns all kinds of cars and millions of dollars. And I'm an only child. And when he dies, I get it all. And he's 90 years old. She says, he says to her, can I have your phone number? And she says, no, no, can I have your father's number? OK. And, <laughs> and then there's one last one. This guy's in a gym, he's 75 years old. These are all inheritance humor we have. Uh, he's 75 years old and he sees this beautiful girl on a treadmill. And he says to his trainer, he says, Bill, you're my trainer. How old is that woman on the train, the beautiful girl on the treadmill? He says, well, that's uh, Margaret, she's, uh, she's 40. He says, okay, I'm 75, she's 40, you're my trainer. What machine in the gym should I use to get her attention and to get her to like me? He says, for you, probably the best machine would be the ATM machine at the front desk. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, let's now talk about, let's, let's now talk about um, uh, protecting your kids. So, in a will, set up a trust for your children. What about kids who are spendthrifts? What about somebody who spends, who you know that will spend every nickel they get if you leave it to them? Well, there are a few things you can do. One is obviously you can think about cutting that child out of your estate, but you may not want that. You may want to protect that child. If you leave the child the money outright, he can take it and do what he wants with it. So one of the things you can do is set up a trust. And trusts are very important vehicles to protect an estate in, in many situations. So you set up a trust where the money for that son who's a spendthrift or an alcoholic or any other addiction problem, you set up a trust where that money is there to protect the child, but it's not managed by the child. It doesn't belong to the child per se. The executor holds onto it, invests it, and then dels out money as the child needs it and if a child says to his executor, who could be the family member, I don't recommend a brother or sister doing it, but some people want that, I need money to go uh, buy some cocaine. Well, guess what? You're not getting the money. I need money uh, for this. No. You need money for rent? I'll give you money for rent. 
and you need money for clothes, I'll give you money for clothes. So we set up what's called a life trust. So for the rest of that child's life, you can rest, be rest assured that the money's protected. The child can't take the money and blow it. And you can set it up in such a way that it goes to that child, but when that child dies, that child can't make a will leaving it to the daughter-in-law that you hate. The will already says that it goes to my grandchildren. Whatever's left in that pot that I set up for my kid, that is not going to be his but managed, it goes to my grandkids when he dies, or his children, or whatever, so that it's protected for the rest of his life, and he can live, uh, and you can sleep at night knowing that you haven't cut your child out of your will and left them penniless and on the street. There's also a situation we talked about if anybody has children who are disabled, or grandchildren who are disabled, and they're collecting ODSP, Ontario Disability Support, um, you need to make a very special will to protect that child's benefits. If you leave your money outright to that child, and there's a substantial sum, that child's benefits will be cut off because you left that child money. So we have to set up what's called a Henson Trust in the will, whereby the money is held, protected in what's called an absolute discretionary trust. Your executor holds it, and the executor decides what happens to that money to protect that child. Uh, and it's very important because if you don't do it, and you don't do it right, it's got to be done right, and I've reviewed many wills that don't have the right trust, uh, the child will be cut off those benefits. So it's very, very important. So those are the use of trust in wills. Uh, and many times they can protect a kid. What about cutting a child out of a will? I have many parents that say to me, I want to cut my child out of my will. Well, you can do it, but you've got to bulletproof your will. So quite often we'll get a capacity assessment, we'll have letters written by you to, to say why you're cutting that child out or why he's getting less than his sisters because uh, that child may challenge the will and we want to make sure that we're protected in case there's a challenge. Um, in terms of people who have companies, oh, one thing I want to mention is be careful about the situation where you leave one child a lot and the other child a little because you don't want to hurt their feelings. So there's a story in the book about a mother who had a very favored child. And that child did everything. She was her caregiver. She was everything to that mother. And the mother said, I want to leave you everything in my estate. And she said, please, mom, don't do that to me because how am I going to face my sister after you die knowing that you're, she's your mother and you cut her out totally, leave her 5%, something small, just as a token. So the mother did that. And the story is called, My Kindness Came Back to Haunt Me. Because guess what? Uh, when the mother died, because that sister was entitled to 5% of the estate, she had a say on everything in that estate. And she made the, this sister's life a living misery. Because every decision this sister made, she said, why didn't you get $5 more? I'd get 5% of it. Why didn't you sell it for more? So our suggestion is leave a sum of money to that daughter so that she's out of the life of your other daughter. The daughter gives her her check for $10,000, $20,000, and away she goes, and she has no say in the estate. And that's very, very important. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of wills, multiple wills, I talked about before, I don't know if anybody has companies, but if you have a company, a privately held company, I had a man come to me who had a very, very big company, and it was worth a fortune. And he had a homemade will. Uh, and I said to him, do you realize what you're doing in this homemade will? He said, well, pretty simple. I'll leave it all to my kids, my wife and my kids. I said, well, what's the value of your company? He said, about 20 million. I said, well, your estate is going to have to, because you have this one will, your company will be put into this one will and will be paid 1.5% on the entire value of your company for probate fees. We're now, we're allowed to make a second will for your company. So you make one will, which is your will, where you talk about your house, your bank, anything where third parties are involved in, real estate, your banks, where you depend on third parties and you need third parties to deal with, and your other assets, like your company, your, your shares in your company, whether it's a store, whether it's an investment company, a holding company, whether it owns real estate, whatever it is, it's your private company. We make a secondary will for that, and when you pass away, as the law now stands, there is no probate on the value of your company. So you can save all the probate and the personal effects get put into that will so there's no probate in the personal effects. So it's something that my partner, Mr. Fish, does. Uh, and I don't get involved in multiple wills like that. Mr. Fish is very complex. And my partner, who is a uh, corporate lawyer, does that. So if anybody has questions, they can speak to him after, the, uh, after the, uh, the evening. So let's talk a little bit now. I'm going to talk about um, a story I want to tell you uh, which is very touching. And what time is it now? It's, so we'll finish in one minute. This is a story that changed my life. 
Uh, and it's something that um, I've told a lot of jokes and stuff, but there's a lot of seriousness to what we do and a lot of tragedy. I mean, I had a man come into me two weeks ago, a young man, and he came into me and he said to me, he said, Les, you know, I like you, you've been good to me. I just want to say goodbye to you. And I said, where are you going? He says, I only have a couple of weeks to live and I want to say goodbye to the people I care about. So this is the kind of stuff that we see. We see life from a different lens, through a different lens. We see life from a different perspective. Uh, our world is something that, you know, we have, we have a lot of sadness, but we have happiness. We see people who, are, who get together, families that work together, but then we see families who rip each other apart. But there was one story that really changed my life, uh, and I, I think it'll change yours in terms of your perspective of what it's all about. I was on breakfast TV one morning, and uh, I get a call from a woman who's in a hospital. And she says to me, she said, Les, I saw you on TV, and I want you to come to the hospital to make a will for me. And I said, I don't do hospital visits. But if you can come to my office, we're in a house on Young Street. We have a big parking lot. There's no charge. You can come park in your parking lot, get somebody to drive you. She said, I haven't been out of the hospital in two to three, I think two and a half years. I don't know if I can go out. I said, if you can ask your doctor and he'll let you go out, you can park in our, come into, we'll make an appointment. You park in my parking lot. I'll come out to your car or van. I will take instructions uh, and then I will uh, go back to my secretary. I'll have it done on the computer and then I'll come out and I'll have the will. You'll sign the will the same day, the same minute, the same whatever. She says, I'll ask my doctor. So she calls me back about an hour later as if she had won the Powerball lottery. I can come out, I can leave, I can come out of the hospital, but it only can come out for about an hour and a half. The doctor says, I shouldn't be out longer. So we booked an appointment. It was a November morning, uh, afternoon, sorry, that we booked the appointment. It was, and the day of that appointment was a cold, rainy, wet, miserable, almost like today, but it was windy and it was pouring and it was just the kind of day where you wake up, you want to roll over and sleep and just not go to work. But I rolled out of bed, went to work, and when you come into a lawyer's office that does wills, there's emails, I hate my brother, emails, where's my money, uh, emails, my mother died two days ago, where's my money, uh, all these kind of fighting and people in the boardroom arguing, and it's a lot of stress. Then we, my partner Barry and I went for lunch. Uh, and we come back on Young Street, and the bus had been in an accident, and Young Street was blocked off, and people were giving the finger and yelling, honking, and then we rerouted to Bayview and came back. Finally, we came back to our office. And we come back in, her appointment's at 1.30, come back in, more emails, more messages, call me back, I need this, I need that, I want to fight, I want to get lost. Whatever. Anyways, finally, uh, at around 1.30, my secretary buzzes me, and she said, a young woman came in to tell us that Ray, her friend Rachel, her mother's friend Rachel, is in the van ready for you to come out to take instructions for a will. So I go out and take my umbrella and it's raining and the wind is blowing and I'm running out and I'm covering you know, my head. And I come to the van and the young woman comes out of the van and she said, Rachel is my mother's best friend. She has not been out of the hospital for over two years and she'll never be out of the hospital again. She has days or weeks to live. And this will be the last time she will ever be outside in daylight again. So I go into the van, and I see that her hand is sticking out the window. And it's just catching these raindrops that are pouring into her hand. And she just keeps cupping it and grabbing it. And then she turns to me, and she says, Mr. Kotzer, isn't it a beautiful day outside? And I thought, wow. You have, you, you know, to me, it was just another day, a day you wanted to roll over, a day that was fighting. But to her, it was the most beautiful day in the world, because it was the last day she was ever outside. And she died a couple of weeks later. And Rachel left something in my heart, and, and I have to tell that story because there's, you know, we hear about badness and fighting, but there are people like Rachel out there that just appreciate life and whatever life they have left. So I just wanted to share that story. But let me just give you uh, some coordinates and then we'll take questions. So my firm is at um, Young, we're on Young Street. I still practice wills, even though I write songs and do all this other stuff, I still do wills. You can make a point with me if you want. Uh, and, um, uh, and Barry does, with his assistant, does corporate wills. Uh, and um, so we're on Young Street. We're, we're young, just uh, below highway, by highway 407, north of Steeles, in a house. So it's very, very low keyed. Uh, there's no suits and all and fancy paintings on the wall. Uh, and basically, you don't have to tell me everything you own. You don't have to, people are afraid, oh my God, it's going to be a terrible experience. You have to list everything I own in my will. No, we try to keep the will as generic as possible. So we would say something like, I leave my house on, I leave any house I own to my son, as opposed to my house on John Street to my son, or any car that I own. Um, we, we don't use words like, I leave my antiques to my daughter, because we don't know what an antique is. And many of the wills we review will say, I leave my memorabilia, I leave my antiques. 
These are words that have to go to court to be interpreted. So we don't have to list every asset you have. We try to keep it as generic. So if you're leaving everything to your wife and then to your kids, we try to keep it so it's, a, like, it's like in a box. So I leave everything I own when I die goes to her, to my wife or son, husband, and then to my kids. We don't list the assets in the will. Where we would list them is if you're pulling assets out, like I'm leaving my cottage to my daughter or son. I'm leaving my uh, condo to my brother. I'm leaving $10,000 to my favorite charity. That is being, that's pulling assets out. We list those. But generally, we don't have to list. But when you come in, we will go through what you need to think about in the will, uh, and we'll go through the assets to make sure that you can, you're doing it properly to avoid probate. We can talk questions about probate. So you can minimize probate if you plan properly and have the right designations. For example, if you name your estate on your life insurance, it's going to be probated. You name your two kids on your life insurance, no probate. So just simple as that. Uh, and so we look at that, we talk about that, and then we basically, uh, that appointment is about 40 minutes, uh, and then with no taking, and then you come back about two weeks later and we sign it up. I, we go through a clause by clause, it's signed. Power of attorney as well, you can either do kits or I can do them for you as a lawyer, it's really up to you. Uh, and that's it. So our phone number is 881-1500, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm extension 19, if you have to reach me. And the other thing I'll tell you, if you, have, if you need other areas of help, help in other areas, Barry and I have a lot of contacts in the, in the legal profession, so um, we can direct you with um, who to speak to. I want to end it with one joke. It doesn't really relate to wills, but I heard this joke, and I thought, I have to tell people this joke. It's, it's called the talking dog joke. And it's just something that um, I think many of us have met people that brag, people who really aren't who they say they are. Many times it's because they inherited money that they have money. Many times it's because their parents are giving them money. They, they have high lifestyles, but like, I've met a lot of people who came into me who are professionals and who are supported by their 90-year-old their mother. Uh, so. This is about that kind of story. So this man is in Newfoundland, and he's driving on the highway, and he sees the sign, and it says, talking dog for sale. So he says, I've got to go buy that talking dog. I want to go. So he goes to the farmer, and he says to the farmer, I'd like to buy that talking dog. And the farmer says, before you buy him, go and meet him. So he goes into the barn, and he's walking around, and he, he doesn't see anything. All of a sudden, he hears this voice behind some haystacks. How you doing today? How are you? And he says, who's talking to me? He says, it's me. I'm Freddie. I'm a dog. He says, you talk? He says, talk? You didn't see me on CNN last week being interviewed by Anderson Cooper? He said, no, I didn't see that. You didn't know I wrote books on the New York Times with a list? No, I didn't see that. You know how we bought this farm because I, I read the stock page and my, I told my owner what to buy uh, and he bought the stock and we bought the farms. That's incredible. He said, well, the shoes you're wearing, I helped to develop those. You're kidding me. He said, I'm in Fortune. I'm everywhere. He said, that's unbelievable. I've never met a dog like you before. He said, I've got to buy you. He says, you can't buy me until next week because I'm speaking to Obama at the United Nations about world hunger. He said, I, I just got to go buy you. So then he runs to the farmer, and he says to the farmer, I want to buy that talking dog, but he must be very expensive. And the farmer says, give me $5 for him. He says, $5 for a talking dog? Why so cheap? And the farmer says, that dog's such a goddamn liar. Anyways, <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for tonight. I want to thank you all for coming. I'll be here a little bit to answer your questions. Though.